Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here at the National Conservation Training Center. And today we're having a special broadcast to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And there's nobody better to help us understand the importance of Silent Spring six decades later, the importance of Rachel Carson, than my guest today, Linda Lear who is a historian, a biographer. She is the biographer of Rachel Carson. She wrote uh, a brilliant book called Rachel Carson, Witness for Nature, really is the definitive book I go to all the time to find out what Carson was doing and, and her importance. Uh, Linda's also written a wonderful biography of Beatrix Potter called Beatrix Potter, A Life in Nature. She also edited one of my favorite books I think everybody should read, which is Lost Woods, right. which is the, the discovered Right. Uh, works of Rachel Carson, wonderful things, everything from letters to the editor to, to works that were published when she was very young or even in mid-career that just aren't easily accessible and really gives you a, a sense of Carson's evolution um, as a writer and conservationist, along with Linda's very helpful descriptions of the importance of these writings. You've written many other things. You. you speak regularly on Rachel Carson. Amazingly, Correct me if I'm wrong, I think you might have written an introduction to, to republications of all of Carson's works. Yes. <laughs> so there's nobody better to celebrate this the 60th anniversary. So Linda, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to see my friend Mark Madison. Well, and uh, what I should have mentioned is Linda's been a huge friend to our archives. Uh, a lot of our Carson work, Almost all of our Carson interpretation, our Carson images, uh, records we have would not be possible without Linda. And of course, Linda donated her own Carson records to the Carson archives at Connecticut College. College. Right. A wonderful resource. Thank you. Thank you. So let me ask you the obvious first question. How did you become interested in Rachel Carson? Well, when I was in college and I was trying to write something about the beginnings of the environmental movement there and I just discovered you know that Rachel Carson was very much involved I went to try to find something about her and there was very little information so eventually I just thought well maybe I ought to poke around here and see if we can put something together because I'm not the only one who's going to ask this question but that's, that's a sort of good good how answer. it all started and it took 10 years. And it took 10 years. <laughs> Why did it take so long? Where were, where were Carson's records? What were the challenges in rediscovering her life? Well, there were, her records were um, at the Fish and Wildlife Service, of course, and then there was a whole collection of her records at Yale University at the Beinecke Library. Mm -hmm. um, that's the rare book and manuscript library. Um, and then there was material in, um, in Springdale, and there was material sort of higgledy piggledy that people had put together. So, it was a it was a search and discover um, mission, and it got out of hand quickly. <laughs> there was more that I discovered than that I knew was existing. So that always mushrooms on the plate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I imagine if we think about it. It probably took Carson about 10 years to gather all the information for Silent Spring, it too. It <laughs> so your, it's yours it's was comforting. an homage. It was comforting, <laughs> yeah. And she was slower than I am, so. What did you, in the, in the writing of your biography, what did you discover about Carson that, that surprised you, that, that you might not have expected? Me. Almost everything about her <laughs> surprised me because she was a very private person. Um, she didn't do interviews. Yeah. Um, she reluctantly testified, you know, before Congress. Um, she, it surprised me how, um, how, in a sense, how cloister she was when she was doing all this, and yet the number of contacts that she had over her career in government and yeah. her career just as a writer that she could pursue and get in the door where other people couldn't. We're still stumbling across Carson letters every so often in the archives really? and so on. She, yeah, she was a remarkable correspondent with, yeah. with people. So what spurred her to write Silent Spring? We've heard many anecdotes 
<laughs> some true right. and some not. So I'm going to the historian, uh, to the source. <laughs> what spurred me on? Hmm? Uh, no, what spurred Carson oh, to write Silent Spring? Oh, what spurred Carson to write Silent yeah. Spring? Yeah, that's a better question. <laughs> Easier one to answer. Yeah. Um, she, um, she was on top of, she had worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service and had contacts there. And she was uh, aware of DDT from the reports that she had gotten and from friends and from colleagues. And I think also aware that it was um, controversial from the start and, and kind of taboo to write about it. Mm -hmm. um, but she thought it was a, a really important mission to bring the problems that DDT created uh, to the public and the health issues and the food issues. Um, and they all became economic issues of one sort or another. And she was uh, aware that she was breaking new ground, that this is not, DDT was uh, thought of as a, I'm not sure what the right word is. She was thought of the great panacea of civilization because it could, uh, if you used it, it could kill imp important diseases and, yep. and bring a better life to millions of poor people um, and to agriculture and to all kinds of things. And people had only looked at the benefits and not really paid any attention to where, well, maybe there, there's some downsides of spraying this so ubiquitously, if that's the right word, on uh, farmlands and everywhere that we're growing or importing, and you can't quite get away from it. So that, that was her mission was to investigate what was the what were the benefits and what were the dangers of widespread use of DDT. Her pre her three previous books had been totally different. They'd been marine biology books and and sea books, sea books, naturalist books. Right. This is what you'll discover, and and really the the mysteries and beauties of the sea, almost like a early Jacques Cousteau. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she predates Jacques Cousteau. Cousteau yes. yeah. no. uh, do you think, when you research Carson, that she thought Silent Spring would be as popular as her? as her other books or, you know, it's really quite different. It's as right. if uh, Stephen King were to write a science book. So right. <laughs> today. Yeah. And I... No, I think, I think she uh, didn't, she didn't really understand how um, vastly different it was going to be. Um, and it was one of those things that you open a small door and a, another door opens up and then another door and you yeah. have to look at this and look at that. Um, a lot of, Publishers and editors thought she was completely bonkers to take such a um, how shall I call it such a nasty subject on. Sure. That she was a writer of beauty and nature and the sea and its wonders, and here this was going to be about death essentially, and about poisoning and um, all kinds of scary things, and who would want to read about that? <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine the pitch. I'm going to give you a, a, a book about death. <laughs> a book about death and right. and you know destruction, po toxins up the food chain, right. and they're probably like, this doesn't sound like a big seller, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, and she got a little of that uh, yeah. feedback. Was, how horrible! What a what a bad idea! But she was very persistent in in thinking that she had to warn. It was it was a burden on her knowledge and integrity to find something out that was important to the public to know and not tell it. So you think that was the spur, huh? That, that she knew something and felt compelled to share it. I think so. I think so. She, that makes a lot of sense. She, Instead of writing a fourth book about the oceans that she loved right. and so on. Um, and, and I think, I think that she was frightened herself for the planet and for the environment and for what harm it could bring if people were just stupid about it. And of course, the, the fact that DDT was a miracle in the war 
yeah. made it controversial. I mean, it, we're, you're attacking something that saved millions of lives, but might now we we think it's a it's a thing that we ought to be protected against. Right. How That's the fascinating. Turned. When we uh, and it's referenced in your book too. Uh, you mentioned she worked for Fish and Wildlife. Right. She was with us. And from, here we are. Yeah, from you know at least as a full-time employee, 1936 to 1951 or 52. Right. And, and there's press releases that she at least oversaw as editor. Her initials are on it way back in 1946 that are pretty alarmist about DDT right after World War II. Because you're absolutely right. It's, it helped win World War II. And right. she's saying in these short press releases, it's, it's basically studies are showing it's killing fish and it might be bad for human health, which is kind of extraordinary yeah. <laughs> early on. It's probably probably not the type of press release that would be to released have. today. Yeah. And uh, that that fear, that, that does resonate. Or the, the, the feeling you need to share this information or people could, could get could sick or die. Yeah. I, and the, the other side too was that it, the DDT was being pushed by the chemical companies that made it uh, as this miracle for farmers and for all kinds of different uses, and yet not really aware that there was a downside to its misuse, right. for sure. And that's what she testified. And that's what she said. <laughs> Telling the other side of the story, right. basically. You, you, the subtitle of your book is Witness for Nature. What did you mean by Witness for Nature? Well, I think Carson had felt compelled, really, compelled to speak out that she, this was not something she had wanted to do. She wanted to write about beauty and about the sea and about uh, nature's wonders. She didn't want to write about a book about death. Um, but here it was on her lap and she had the information and um, she had a publisher in uh, Paul Brooks yep. who, who was supportive of taking on uh, this nasty subject. I mean, publishers would run from this idea uh, as soon as they heard it because nobody wants to have a, write a, publish a book about death right. and, that, and the end of the planet. Come on, so that's not going to make any money for anybody. But she persisted and... Um, and convinced people that this was a vital, uh, vital science, and that was had been easily covered up, um, not necessarily maliciously, but wasn't known, wasn't out there, um, and farmers were using it, and um, households were using it, uh, housewives were using it, and, and it was a dangerous, uh, toxic substance. Was she surprised at its success after it was published in 1962? Was she surprised? At its success, at how popular oh, it became? Oh, I think she was. Um, because initially, <clears throat> publishers and press had run away from the subject. You know, oh no, nobody's going to want to read about that. It's an ugly subject. So yes, I think on one level she was quite surprised. But she, she also had friends and people like her publisher who were telling her that this was important and let's try it. Let's tip our feet in the water and see what happens. So she risked it. Yeah. So it was published in 1962, came out earlier in the New Yorker. So she probably had a little idea of how the reaction might go right. <laughs> from that. Right. Uh, but there, there aren't a lot of 60 year old environmental books people are still reading today that has the impact where people are being asked to, to reflect and you've been asked nonstop. You probably could have spoken on the anniversary every week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. You'd been able. Why do you think Silent Spring still resonates with people? Well, I think uh, people are more aware than they used to be of the fact that um, Advertisers, big business, there are motives uh, among certain elements of society that don't want the public to know 
about something that could be dangerous or messy or God help us, you know, fatal. Yeah. Um, and it's not good for business, <laughs> for one thing. So there was a, you know, a, a, a good deal of attempt to keep this kind of science quiet. And that still resonates today. Does it? <laughs> yeah. Do you think Carson really is the, the starting point for some aspects of the modern environmental movement? I do. I do indeed. I, because she led the way in, in uh, insisting that the public had a right to know um, that if this was true. Um, so now what do we do? Do we sit on it? Do we pretend it isn't there? And we let people die and we let people get injured or poisoned or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was in the, you know, a lot of her friends and acquaintances said, oh no, that's, that's a nasty subject and it's depressing. You, people aren't gonna wanna read about that. And Carson said, no, this is really important. And she had some supporters who agreed with her and onward she went. You know, when people hear about Silent Spring but haven't read it, Right. It's uh, an indictment of DDT and other similar long-lived, persistent, Chemical. dangerous pesticides, right. chemicals, and so on. Um, and it seems like a really dry read. <laughs> yeah. see, it seems like, you yeah. know, this is probably not what I want to read. Just right. tell me what the, right. the conclusion is. But in fact, it's almost amazingly eloquent. Um, and it's... It, it, it can seem like an odd combination that there's these beautiful passages that could have come out of any of her earlier nature prose, right. almost like like Burroughs or Thoreau used to write, um, and yet the the topic is you know death and destruction of birds, fish, potential uh, human impacts, and so on. Um, I can't think of any other book like that, to be honest. You read books from that same area, Population Bomb and so on. They're not eloquent. They're polemic. Um, right. And and that, do you think that's the key to why people still read Silent Spring or remember Carson? Mm. Or Well, it certainly isn't a hard read. I mean, in the sense no. that it's beautifully written, and anybody yeah. who cares about good writing and, and, and good journalism uh, finds inspiration in it. Um, but it, it was a it was a big risk for everybody involved. You know, DDT, a book about it. Oh no, please, <laughs> no, don't yeah. do that. <laughs> so, and I think that's still um, with us to, to an extent. Why do I want to know about this? But on the other hand, I think that the what Silent Spring did was to raise an awareness of in the public that. You better, you better find out, you better know what you're doing to the earth, to your family, to, to chromosomes, to, you know, you name it in science. There's a huge, uh, a vast implication of knowing something like this. So don't smother it, don't sit on it, get it out there. The other thing I think she did was to do it in a way that wasn't as an alarmist, mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't as someone who was uh, crying wolf, wolf. Um, it was, you know, she was calm, cool, collected, scientific. Um, this is what I've learned and what I found out, and this is what I think we ought to make the public aware of. So it's a whole different tone, I think, tone of voice. It's not scary in the sense of I'm, I'm going to alarm you with all this. It's, here are the facts, here's what's going on, and I think you ought to know about it. You, that's really interesting. The, here's the facts, and earlier you mentioned journalist. And I, almost nobody equates Carson with a journalist. Right. But I know from your book, um, she regularly published articles in right. the Baltimore Sun and so on. So she knew how to write as a journalist and, and her publications that weren't government ones were going in this. And that's a really good point. Silent Spring almost reads like a, a Woodward and Bernstein right. <laughs> investigation, right. um, which can also be eloquently written. It's kind of the heyday of, of journalism when Carson was writing the 50s and right. 60s. Newspapers with millions of readers, robust. Um, 
and New Yorker, obviously a, a, a hotbed of investigative journalism. That is an interesting point, Linda, and it's it, it really is, it's not a scientific book. No. It's an investigative journalist unearthing this, and it is calm. Uh, you know, it ends with there's two roads. It doesn't say we've already fallen off the cliff. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> We're just waiting to hit the ground. It's right. like, take this road, which leads hopefully to the EPA and the Clean Air Act and the Endangered Species Act, or you can take this, this horrible road and you live in a, a dystopia of yeah. dead birds and yeah. fish and, and, and sickness. Those, and those are good keep, points. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, thank you. It's, um, she had a choice, certainly, as to whether to scare people out of their wits right. or to inform them and also set an alarm out that you better know what you're doing and you better ask questions and what about these big companies that manufacture something that they're not even totally aware of the long-term impacts of. So I believe that she she taught a journalistic public um, uh, profession in a way how to how to really bring an, a controversial situation to the public, to the to the fore, but she also resisted setting a, a panic um, in 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 flux or in in tow that you know people would completely stop buying, stop eating, stop planting, right. et cetera. So and it could have gone either way. Her biography is really compelling and sad. So she, she publishes 60 years ago, 1962, uh, Silent Spring. Immediately generates huge controversy. There's, there's CBS documentaries, there's op-ed pieces. She's in the midst of it, doesn't seem to engage in it directly all the time or right. full time, but does Senate testimony, does, does the CBS documentary, does Few, with some speeches. reluctance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then she dies in right. 1964. And, and one of the intriguing questions would be, do you have any idea what she would have pursued next? You know, she has such an interesting ocean book, sea right. books, and then Silent Spring is a, a change of pace. Do you think she would have gone back to the sea books or more what? investigative <laughs> environmental books? That's a really good question. We don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. She hadn't started another book, presumably. No, she <laughs> yeah. hadn't started yeah. another book. Um, I think she was intrigued herself with what the public was going to do with this information, where the government was going to go with it. Um, but the public, for sure, that could she arouse the public to something they needed to be aware of and wouldn't be necessarily because if you tell all the, the, the dirty details of DDT, nobody's going to buy it, <laughs> um, right. for sure. And this was something that housewives were buying in spray cans and using in their homes. Using in paint. <laughs> and, in paint, indeed, yeah, right. indeed. Yeah. So, um, and there was economic pressure on her not to go further. Right. So she took a big risk. I wonder what she would have written. Now, the other, the other legacy where she was prescient was the, the actually brief article, posthumously published book, Sense of Wonder, um, which, which came true with a vengeance. What happens when people are disconnected, young people are disconnected from nature? Do you, I, I don't know if she would have pursued that any further, if that was a one-off. I think it was probably a one-off, um, although... Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, the poor biographer doesn't know. No. Um, Historians aren't good at looking in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's not our, our no, discipline. It's not our, <laughs> it's not our field. Yeah. That's not where we go. Um, but I think that the reaction of young people, and there was a reaction of young people to this kind of information, led her to think that this was an important uh, publicity thing to do. Um, and that the young people were the ones who could make the decision as to whether or not you go down this road or down this road um, as young voters, as participants in the in democratic discussion. Um, but she didn't really know, of course, and right. um, 
she took a risk. She took a big risk. And it, it you know, she didn't live that much longer, yeah. sadly. But I think she knew before she died that she had awakened a, a public to an important question of what what is government doing and what what are we knowing and and protecting ourselves against or or promoting imagine and, if we had her to write about climate change oh boy oh boy. <laughs> eloquent wouldn't that be wonderful yeah. and that was i don't want to jump over it that connection between youth and sense of nature and silent spring that's a good connection usually they're seen as kind of disparate things. right she wrote this and then she wrote that and you know but there that's a that's an interesting connection that i i think her, her you know her all her writing is sort of of a piece and it does flow together and, and what she was aware of and working for fish and wildlife was a real eye opener for her um she was right on the ground floor, and she could, she had access um, that many a, a, a scientific writer wouldn't have had. So she she used it properly. She used it cautiously. Um, she wasn't interested in sensationalism, right? Which she could have been. Another another author could have been, and probably made mountains of money from it. But she was a scientist, and she was uh, cautious about what she was going to put out under her name. Well, that's a good point, too. Her Probably the most famous uh, pamphlet she edited with us was the Conservation in Action series. Oh, right. Very eloquent, beautiful, but also very sober. Yeah. <laughs> right? Just like Silent Spring. And, and maybe being a government scientist, a government writer, um, permeated to a certain extent. We present the facts. We, we you know, have an objective air, but also... Clearly, there's a passion for nature that that comes through in the prose and so on. It right. isn't and, a robot, right? And, and, and she had she felt she had an obligation, and the one it was one of the chapters, the obligation to endure. Yep. And she took that obligation very seriously. That if the public wasn't aware of scientific dangers, scientific implications of what was going on. Um, then there was really no hope. And uh, we might just put a basket over our heads and just plod on. I think, oh, this has just occurred to me sort of, but I think that the time in which she was writing had a lot to do with uh, how, how bold she felt she could be. Yes. Um, government was doing a lot of different things and um, so was private industry. And it was a, it was a, perfect time in history, really, for somebody to come along and, and to question, well, where are we going with this? What's going to happen if we know this? Or what's going to happen if it's muzzled and we don't know this? That is important. She was writing at the beginning of the 60s yeah. when, when people were starting to question authorities and so on. Was Carson our first hippie? <laughs> yeah, in a way. Yeah. In a way. I yeah, think you're right. Up. I think you're right. Well, one other thing that's changed is... is as becomes clear in her biography, um, Carson was, it was not easy to be a woman biologist uh, no. in Carson's career. Um, and she was um, really the only one <laughs> we had outside of maybe fisheries, there were a couple, but I mean really it, it was the very few female scientists, but some important ones. Now in her home agency, about half our new employees are, are women really yeah and I I've, which I think would make Carson Rachel happy. really happy yep. she had close female friends and really seems to have been a great friend right great colleagues you know that that went on to form <laughs> councils and so on to, right. to honor her memory that's a good friend uh, do you think Carson is responsible for more women going into the biological uh, sciences oh, I, I, I wouldn't know, know that she alone is responsible because it was a time when there were other um, women who were doing important research, and that was coming out. But I think I think she was because of her ability to to write and to communicate with the public. That it's very rare. I mean, you can be articulate, but then you can be also you can't be um, 
a crusader. You, it, it's, 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 she had a marvelous uh, ability to combine her, her intellectual discovery notions with, not her intellectual discovery of, of science and of, of uh, industry with uh, a passion to not to frighten people, but yep. to inform. Well, last question. <laughs> so since your book came out, was it first edition 1997? Yeah. Witness for Nature. So you spent, what, 25 years. <laughs> so maybe longer. I'm not, yep. uh, but over 25 years um, and even 10 years before that, living with Carson's biography, being a spokesperson for her, telling her story. Um, is there something about Carson um, that inspires you? Oh, lots of things about Carson inspire me. Um, I think as a, as a historian, as a, uh, someone who loves research too, I, I'm always impressed with how capable she was of picking up the slimmest kind of corner and looking underneath it to see what was there and going on with it. I mean, she was not deterred by naysayers or people who said, oh, there's nothing here, look mm -hmm. over there. Um, she was going to determine to be, look underneath that. And she did. Um, I don't think there are too many, certainly, well, there are. There are good women journalists now. Um, there are opportunities that she certainly, Rachel certainly never had yeah. to, to um, inform. Um, she was pre-television news. Um, and she was also very shy and, and retiring and, and she really didn't like this aspect of her job. You know, she would never have chosen to be um, a point person or a spokesman for this or that. So it was hard. It was very hard for her, but she pursued. Yep, she persevered. Well, yep. Linda, this was wonderful. I think part of me thinks, you know, there's nobody better on the 60th anniversary of Silent oh. Spring to speak to it. Thank you. But I also wonder if, if Carson could ever have imagined, <laughs> 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 having left us in 1952 that, you know, I don't know, 75 years later, uh, there would we'd be speaking about her in a place like this where half our students are, are women. basically women biologists. I mean, I think she would be very excited oh, about that. I think and, she would and, be and, and, so pleased, so and, pleased and so excited. And, you know, there's nothing more gratifying than feeling like you're, what you labored over, what you, what you cried over, what you passionately believed in wasn't just buried under the rug and that other people, other generations are looking at it too and saying, oh yeah, we better, we better think about what we're doing. Well, thanks Linda, this was evocative and, and thought provoking. And, and your questions uh, wonderful. are great, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> well, your answers are the key. So thanks again thank for you. helping us celebrate the 60th anniversary. And I yeah. want to thank everybody that, that tuned in uh, to watch this. And your homework is go out and read Silent Spring or reread Silent Spring uh, with new eyes. Right, and keep going. <laughs>